nothing but nothing is better than having somebody who knows what it's all about and can, you know, translate uh, nuke speak and uh, translate energy speak. And uh, Arnie's done a great job there. And welcome, Arnie Gunderson. Oh, God. <laughs> wow, that's quite a buildup. Thank you. Uh, yeah, the, um, there's one other person I should introduce you to. Where'd he go? Dave Link is our... Oh, there he is, yeah. He's a, he's a video guy, and if you need video, Dave does it. He's a cool guy. Um, so, yeah, thank you. Um, there's a, a couple things. I, I, I Basically, you gave half my speech already. I'll be real quick. You sent it to me. I know. <laughs> but the, uh, um, the, it's an interesting word that, uh, that, that you use. How do you say S-A-F-S-T-O-R-E? Safe That's what they, it's, they, they, if you really say it, if, you're, if your third grade English teacher was here right now, it would be SAF store, right? Yeah. SAF rhymes, rhymes with SAP, you know, SAP, SAF store. So I'm trying to change my vocabulary to call it SAF store, because it certainly is not safe store. <laughs> As a matter of fact, one of the near misses in nuclear history occurred when a plant was in safe store. It was Dresden 1. In, uh, uh, in Illinois, and um, they, had, they had shut the plant down, and they turned the heat off, and they walked away, and a pipe froze, and it began to drain the fuel pool. And luckily, and it is purely luck, that a watchman noticed 60,000 gallons of water in the basement and said something's got to be wrong. If that watchman had come through a day later, the radioactivity levels on that site would have been so high, the site would have had to be evacuated. The water level in the fuel pool would have drained down, and essentially you would have had a giant x-ray machine that would have made the site uninhabitable. So that's what safe store is. I think SAF store is a, is a better term. Um, it is certainly not necessarily safe, especially when the fuel is still in the, in the fuel pool. So. Um, I will try there in this presentation, and I urge you to uh, don't give the NRC that word. That's uh, 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 as it's spelled, it's it's uh, SAF store, and, and let's throw it back to them that way. So anyway, um, I'm Arnie Gunderson, and uh, Maggie and I live in Burlington, and we have this this business uh, called Fairwinds Associates, and I do a lot of expert reports around the uh, around the country and a couple of around the world, and. Um, then uh, separately, though, uh, we establish a nonprofit, which is Fairwinds Energy. And if you've ever gone up on the web, you'll see all the, all the videos we put up. Um, Maggie and I don't draw a salary from Fairwinds Energy. We, the, the, the donations we get go to uh, the audiovisual and keeping the site active and things like that. Um, the, the concept of Fairwinds Energy was Maggie's. And uh, to just tell you real quick, what happened was over the years, I, I had been working with reporters a lot, and, and when Fukushima happened, the, the accident at Daiichi, um, that was on a Friday, and Saturday and Sunday, the calls were frantic. I mean, the New York Times called for four hours, Wall Street Journal called for four hours, Washington Post four hours, on and on and on. I was on the phone constantly. So then Monday morning, I come out in the New York Times and Washington Post as a nuclear expert. Well, what does CNN do? They read the newspaper and they say, well, here's a guy he's mentioned in two newspapers as a nuclear expert, he must be a nuclear expert. And so they brought me in to be their commentator on, on, the, on their shows. And by the way, CNN does not pay. It, it's your, they believe you get all this free publicity and, and so it's not like, uh, when you hear Brian Williams making $13 million, CNN gives zero to their, um, their, their experts, but that's fine. Um, so they were giving me about eight minutes of airtime, which was really a lot of time, and it wasn't enough. And Maggie had been bugging me for years to, to do videos, and I said, who wants to hear an old man talk, is what sort of my reaction. And so um, finally, we were about three or four or five days into the accident, and, and um, while, I was, while I could say a lot on CNN, I couldn't say enough, I said, okay, let's do a video. So our little static site, on a good day, we used to have 80 visitors. Uh, most days it was 10 or 12. Um, our little static site went, to, when we put the first video up, went to 10,000. 
Then the second video, it went to 25,000 and we crashed the servers and they threw us off the network and there was, it was been an incredible ride since then uh, for Fairwinds Energy, our, our uh, little nonprofit. And our total reach has been in excess of 10 million people so far. And so I, I, I got to give credit to the media, I'm just a talking head here, the media strategy behind us is, is Maggie's. So anyway, let's talk about SAP Store. And um, as we were funded by the Lintelac Foundation to do this work. Um, and when, uh, when I looked at, the, the, at SAP Store, I determined that Vermont Yankees getting away with stuff because the NRC regulations are so lax. This is what, what Chris was just saying. So really, they're kind of inextricably intertwined. You know, we've got NRC regulations and, uh, and what is happening at Vermont Yankee, uh, and it will be very difficult to change it because the NRC has basically, uh, a priesthood has convinced themselves that, th that this, is, uh, uh, this is completely safe. So, uh, with that in mind, I'm sort of going to be talking about Vermont Yankee, but the real issue behind this is lax regulation at the, uh, at the NRC. So there's this thing called the PSDAR, and I had it down here as the, the post-shutdown decommissioning analysis report, but I do think it's activities report now that... Is that now, right, Mr. Cool? I, I, I think it is. Okay. It's, uh, yeah, activities report. So they have this, this thing that they publish... They have to have it out six months after they shut down. And it's a, um, it's a report, about 300 pages long. You can get it on the, uh, uh, the, the department's website. The, yeah. the Department of Public Service website. Yeah, DPS has it on their, uh, on their website, so it's available. Um, and, and I read it in depth. Now, separately, before that, we were contracted with the Joint Fiscal Office in 2010 to look at earlier reports that were generated every five years by uh, Vermont Yankee. And they, they were, uh, they compared what was in the fund with what was, with what was available. And I'll come back to that. But, so we had looked at uh, the 06 report and the 012 report, and now came this PSDAR. So the first thing I want to talk about is safety, and the second thing I want to talk about is, is money. No, I, I'm sorry I got to look at this. I had, th this was going to be a PowerPoint, but the projector here was not compatible with my Apple. So we will um, provide this to Chris and we'll put it up on the web. And it will also be interlaced when we get the video done. We'll interlace the slides with the video so you'll actually be able to see what it was we're, we're talking about. So safety first. The, um, this, this SAF store has no scientific basis. This 60-year number has no basis in science at all. It, um, decommissioning is straightforward. I, I decommissioned several facilities in, in my professional career. And with the exception of being radioactive compared to being you know, arsenic or chemical or whatever, it's essentially a, a straightforward uh, working with a hazardous material process. And um, th th this is not rocket science. A lot of it uses wrecking balls and bulldozers. So this is not rocket science. Now the NRC will tell you that they want to wait 60 years because they want to lower the exposure to the people that work there. And the, uh, the real issue though is that they, they claim that if you wait 60 years, the total exposure to the workers will be 300 rem. Rem is a measure of exposure. Uh, over, for over 60 years, it'll be 300 rem, and we need to keep that number low, so we need to wait 60 years. However, when a power plant's down and needs to come back up to make money, the NRC looks the other way. And, and the, the example is at Palisades, which is another energy plant, just last year, they had to make a, um, make a repair, and they were shut down for one month, and in that one month, they gave 115 rem to a group of people to get that plant up and running. So when the issue is getting a power plant back online, the NRC really doesn't care about REM. But when the issue is, can we delay this to make, to, to, uh, to, as a subsidy to the nuclear industry, then the NRC hides behind the poor workers that need to have their exposure reduced. 
So it's, um, you can't have it both ways, and the NRC definitely tries to. So it's really, as Chris said, it's a subsidy. If they, if they were required to put all the money in that was necessary, the cost of nuclear electricity would go up and, and nuclear plants would shut down. So if you delay the time that that nuclear plant needs to be decommissioned for 60 years, there's less money in the fund, which means that um, nuclear can compete with you know, coal or oil or natural gas um, on, a, um, on, a, on, a, on a field that's not level at all. Um, when a coal plant shuts down, it's dismantled pretty quickly, and, and yet a nuke requires 60 years. In Vermont, by the way, windmills are required to have all of their decommissioning money before they start. You know, those dangerous windmills, you've got to watch out for them. But a, a nuclear power plant can wait 60 years until there's enough money to, uh, uh, to, to start it up. So it's really about a subsidy to, to the industry. Um, would you, uh, you know, have a gas station in your town that sat there idle for 60 years? The answer is, of course not. You know, you would do something about it. So the, um, the second thing, and, and it's almost like we, we planned this, synergy. Chris. <laughs> the second thing is the, is the spent fuel pool. Um, Vermont Yankee is less risky now that it's shut down than when it was running. That's good. But the risk has not gone to zero. The fuel pool is... Um, you know, essentially a giant swimming pool, um, 120 feet in the air. And uh, as, I, as I told you, at uh, Dresden, the fuel pool leaked. And um, the, there's enough material in the nuclear pool. There's, a, the, there's 700 nuclear bombs worth of cesium in that pool. So that if the pool becomes exposed and if the pool were to catch fire, you're talking about 700 Hiroshima's worth of cesium are sitting in that pool. So there's a significant risk and a non-zero, uh, a significant consequence and a non-zero risk. So the NRC prefers to think that that risk is zero, uh, but they don't factor into that at tourists and they don't factor into that the experience they already have at Dresden where, where one of these things already failed. So we have major consequences with admittedly a lower uh, probability of a failure than when the plant was running. But still, there's a finite probability of failure. Would you use that term? The train wreck? No, 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 the other one. The probability, the NRC guy. Oh, oh a fairly high risk operation. There we go, okay. Bruce Watson. So there's, it is a fairly high risk operation with enormous consequences if they get it wrong. Um, so. What's in the best interest of Vermonters uh, like Chris? And, and we did not coordinate before I walked in the door here. We need to keep the, um, the, the emergency plan in place until the fuel is out of that fuel pool and, and on the ground. Now, Entergy said, well, if we do that, it's going to cost $100 million in the next five years. That's baloney. It may cost $2 million a year for five years. So $10 million to keep the emergency organization in place and as for, if, it's, if it's important to Vermonters, we should take that out of the fund. You know, that's, that's money that should, is well spent to keep that part of the state safe in the event that, a, that an accident happens. Um, so we should dip into the decommissioning fund for this $10 million to keep that, that staff integrated with the, uh, with the facility, considering, considering the risk. So, the, um, the other thing is moving spent fuel. Um, the spent fuel will be in there five years. They said uh, 2019, and they shut down a couple months ago. So four to five years. And um, after which it will be uh, removed slowly into enormous canisters. The, the, there's one canister that weighs 70 tons empty, 70 tons empty. And then they put nuclear fuel in it, and it comes up to about 100 tons. And then they lift that out of the nuclear fuel pool, drive it over to the side on a, a huge crane, and then lower it very slowly down a shaft to the ground. And they put it into another concrete canister when it gets on the ground. But fully loaded, uh, coming out of the fuel pool, it weighs about 100 tons. Now, I think I might be the only person in Vermont who still remembers this, but in 2008, 
the brakes broke on that crane. Remember that? Yeah. You know, nobody talks about that. The brakes broke on the crane. So that's a problem because, you know, not all, this is a, this is, we know there is a probability of failure. We've experienced the probability of failure. And yet, we have the school right across the street. So the spent fuel will stay for five years. Um, the, uh, the brakes already have been known to fail once. And there's been other problems with refuelings as well at other sites where the canister was moved over places where had it dropped, it would have punctured the fuel pool. So not only would the single canister weighing 100 tons fall uh, 100 feet onto the ground and shatter and, and, and make the site uninhabitable, but um, these canisters have periodically been moved in the wrong locations and they would have fallen into the fuel pool. And the fuel pool cannot stand the weight of a 100 ton canister falling on it. You would puncture the fuel pool. So this is serious stuff. And it has happened here in Vermont, the brakes fail. So, my thought on this is it has to be done, and it's much safer to get it on the ground. But while it's up there, and especially as it's moving, we have that school across the street. And I think they should move the fuel in the summer when the school is closed. So one of the recommendations we're going to come out is they can do this. This is not rocket science. You can plan your schedule so that uh, you know Jan June, July, and August, and maybe into the beginning of September, you've got the fuel pool empty. This is a doable thing, and um, it would not eliminate the risk to the whole area, but the, certainly the, the most likely people to be imp uh, impacted if there were an accident would be the kids. And there's a simple solution. Just don't do it when the kids are in school. These canisters, by the way, are about as tall as Chris and I, 12, 13 feet, you know, if, if you were on my shoulders, if I were on your shoulders. And um, uh, pretty impressive. They're, they're extraordinarily strong. And the reason they have to be is because they have an extraordinary amount of radiation. You know, each canister probably has something on the order of 10 nuclear bombs worth of cesium inside it. Um, they remain terrorist targets uh, while, they're, while they're above ground. Entergy had the opportunity of buying a different cask which could be set in the ground and they chose not to because those were more expensive. Uh, so we have these things sticking out of the ground now and we will until the federal government uh, picks them up. So the, the other and probably the last point on safety is we had a leak at Vermont Yankee and it's been referred to as the, the tritium leak. But it wasn't tritium. Uh, power plants around the country have leaked tritium, and only tritium. And there are certain tanks, the condensate storage tank is the example, when they leak, they only leak tritium because that's all that's in it. The leak at Connecticut, at Vermont Yankee, was different from every other plant in the country except for one, which was Connecticut Yankee. And that leak, leak had some tritium in it, but it also had cesium-137, strontium-90, and cobalt-60. Uh, all of which are really bad actors. Cesium is a um, muscle seeker, causes something called Chernobyl heart in kids. Um, strontium is a uh, bone seeker and causes leukemia. Um, so we know that the Vermont Yankee site, unlike all these other sites in the country that have had, quote, tritium leaks, uh, the Vermont Yankee site has cesium and strontium. And we know that. that when I was on the oversight panel, um, they dug down next to the building that was leaking, and it was called the AOG building. And that stands for the, uh, I want to say, Augmented Advanced Off Gas. It was built in 1970, and they're still calling it advanced technology. It's the AOG building. Um, so the AOG building had a leak in it, and they dug next to the building to, to pick up as much of the dirt as they could. They could not dig under the building because the building was seismic. And if they did, it would have caused the seismic constraints to be compromised. So they chose not to dig under. So we know under the building, they've actually done cores under the building and found strontium and found cesium under the building. We know it's there. So uh, at Connecticut Yankee, they had a, a similar leak with strontium. The strontium got down into the groundwater and cost an extra billion dollars to clean up. That's not the total job, 
the total job was around five, six, seven hundred million. But to get the tritium that had gone into the groundwater at Connecticut Yankee, it cost another billion dollars. Now, Connecticut Yankee was a uh, publicly owned utility and not a merchant plant. So this is a, one of these differences where the, the rules for merchant plants are awfully hazy. Uh, and what, what happened in Connecticut was they didn't have enough money in the fund, but it was a utility. And they raised everybody's rates in the state of Connecticut 100 million a year. So that's how they recovered the cost. Um, and the point I'm trying to make in, in the hearings is that if we wait 60 years to decommission that building, you're giving the cesium and strontium a chance to spread. I think right now that building should be completely dismantled and, um, and that radioactive waste removed from the soil. Um, you know, the, why let more horses out of the barn? We know most of them are still under that building, but to, in, in the news this week says they're moving. And the numbers are that they are now half of the uh, EPA allowable limits at the well that they happen to have tested. But between that well, which might happen to be back by you, Jimmy, and, and, and where the source is, it's gotta be higher. There's more cesium in the ground than they're measuring at that well, and nobody wants to measure it, and nobody wants to talk about it. And, you know, shame on energy, but I'm not, not surprised. surprised. But the, within the Shumlin administration, too, uh, no one wants to really uh, do something about it. So my, my other recommendation here is that that building, that AOG building, be completely decommissioned now. And the, uh, uh, it also has a secondary advantage. It's probably about a $40 million job, maybe a $50 million job to do. The fund is at 650, so there's enough money to do it, and they'd have to do it anyway years from now. But it does provide employment for people in the Brattleboro area, in an area that's looking for employment. So we have an opportunity for uh, you know, a year and a half of construction work while this building's being uh, decommissioned as well. Um, if we don't do it now, we run the risk of the cost being astronomical, potentially a billion dollars, um, when they finally get around to it. Because then they've got to dig up the whole site to chase this, this strontium and cesium. Um, why not trap it right now and, and minimize the risk to the river and minimize the cost to, to Vermonters? Um, so this new strontium discovery, uh, I'll be on Mark Johnson tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock talking about this. Yeah. 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 yeah, Mark Johnson tomorrow morning, 9 o'clock, 9.05. Uh, discussing this. Uh, Maggie and I wrote a report for the Joint Fiscal Office in 2010 about the, um, uh, uh, we foresaw that the, that the cesium and the strontium were going to move in the groundwater. There was a way to prevent it. They had extraction wells and they had monitoring wells on the site. They were pulling mortar out of the ground during the worst of the leak and trapping it in large bladders and then shipping them to, uh, to Tennessee for disposal um, in, in, in trucks. So what happened, uh, what we recommended is keep those extraction wells going. Now this is at the end of the Douglas administration and um, Entergy chose to shut them down because they claimed the problem was solved. And in fact, what happened was this, just as we predicted in writing to a report to the Joint Fiscal Office, the, the strontium ran, and now we've got a bigger problem on our hands. Um, so this was foreseeable, and it's not, I, I don't claim to be clairvoyant. Well, Every, sure. Everybody in the industry knows this. It's just as probably only Maggie and I are the only people who want to talk about it. You know? <laughs> That's the difference. It's not clairvoyance. It's just that it, it's just, some people are willing to talk about okay. it, and Others most are, are not. Um, so that uh, there's also a risk of um, you know, contaminating the... Uh, Connecticut River in bioaccumulation, even though the, the, the if, let's say it's at safe drinking levels, what happens is, is it gets into the river, it winds up in the benthic organisms and, and it's, a, uh, strontium and calcium are identical to each other in the periodic table and one's right over the, t the other one. So that every place calcium goes, strontium goes. So it goes into shells on, on different kind of critters at the bottom of the river. It goes into the fish bones 
when people eat the fish, it goes into your bones and things like that. So uh, strontium is an analog for cesium and it's, it's dangerous. So let's nip it in the bud now, take the source away, and you know, perhaps 20 or 30 years from now when it comes time to completely dismantle the plant, the most of the remaining strontium will have, uh, will have disappeared. The, uh, the last point I want to make is we're going to ship all this nuclear waste, except the fuel. The fuel is a different issue, but the building, when it gets decommissioned, is going to get shipped to Andrews County, Texas. And we're in a compact. Vermont and Texas are in a compact. And this land at Andrews County has uh, five nuclear plants are going to be ultimately disposed there. Right now, Vermont Yankee is the first. But if we wait 60 years, the other ones might come in first. And we may run out of land in, in Andrews. And we'll have to keep this thing even longer. Um, so uh, it's prudent to dismantle the plant as quick as we can and, and send it to Texas. The nuclear fuel may sit there for 100 years. but the nuclear plant itself, uh, we have an opportunity to get it to Texas and uh, uh, we should avail ourselves of that opportunity. Okay, next thing is economics. So that was safety. Those are the safety issues. Uh, now let's talk about money. Um, we don't want to, our basic position is Vermonters shouldn't be burdened by the extra, co the extra costs of the final cleanup. Um, and it shouldn't be a generational transfer. You know. The, the theory was with decommissioning that the people who used the power paid for it and, and were responsible for the decommissioning. Waiting 60 years just kicks this can down to our, our grandkids. And that's not fair because they didn't use the power. So if we're going to do it, we really should do it because we used it. It's our responsibility. Um, I looked at this PSDAR and there's a table in it that talks about how the funds will be spent. And the table shows that Entergy has already spent $15 million of that $650 million. And they spent it in 20, that's why is right. Yeah, that's, that's my next line. On what? Yeah. <laughs> um, they spent it in 2013 and 2014. They've already spent $15 million of the fund's money. Now the NRC hasn't released that money back to Entergy, but Entergy has a claim already for work that they did before the plan ever shut down for $15 million. Now the PSDAR, this 300-page this document, um, looks an awful lot like a cut and paste job from previous reports that they've already submitted to the state. Now, I used to run a group that did those reports, and they're about 100,000 bucks. So that PSDAR is about a $100,000 effort. I don't know where the $15 million went. So uh, that's a question we as Vermonters have a right to ask. Because if you remember this MOU that Chris was talking about, at the end of the day, if there is any excess, half of it is ours. So we have a seat at the table. We should be engaged in this, in this dialogue. Um, okay, so. Entergy, as a, as a um, um, merchant plant, has no incentive to minimize costs in the decommissioning. Because they've already said if they run out of money, they're going to walk away. But the other interesting thing is that Entergy is using TLG engineering to write the PSDAR and to manage the overall decommissioning. Now, why is that critical? TLG Engineering is a wholly owned subsidiary of Entergy. So what's happening here is they couldn't make money while the plant was running. So now they're going to make money while the plant is shut down by funneling all of the work through their own subsidiary. Um, TLG, by the way, stands for Tom LaGuardia. And Tom and I were, were co-workers at the job in the, in the nuclear industry. That's, uh, that's where it came from. Um, Tom went off and formed TLG, which then got bought by Entergy. So they're farming the work into a subsidiary they control. And as a merchant plant, they have no oversight. There is no auditor. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission doesn't audit them, and the state of Vermont doesn't audit them. So there's no control on how that money is spent. So, so one of the things we're going to be asking for in our written comments 
and in our comments to the NRC next week, is who's, who's watching these guys? Who's making sure there's no competitive bidding? TLG got the job because TLG's a subsidiary. Without competitive bidding, you're not going to get a, a great price. And in fact, the, um, uh, it's likely without competitive bidding, TLG's going to up the rates. So that um, uh, it will be very profitable for Entergy. Um, also, the, the staff that Entergy has on site is also marked up too. So that, that you know, there's perhaps 100 or 150 people. There will be in 2016, 2017. Well, each of those people have a you know, 100% markup on each of them, which is money for Entergy as well. So who's watching that? The state of Vermont is out of the picture because they are a merchant plant. And the NRC, as far as I've read those regulations, has no control over the finances either. Um, yeah, they're, well, they're not owned by anybody. You know, they're, they're owned by Entergy, as opposed to a utility. You know, the, the, the rate payers in the state had a relationship with the utility. The rate payers in Vermont have no relationship with Vermont Yankee. It's just, it's an asset owned by a corporation based in Louisiana. Um, anyway, the, the NRC has a formula to calculate um, uh, how much money you have to put in. It's literally one paragraph of law. And there's no scientific basis for the formula either. And it's called 10 CFR 50.75. 10 CFR, 10 Code of the Federal Regulations is nuclear 50s power reactors, paragraph 75. So it's the power reactors, paragraph 75 section of law. And it tells you how much money you have to put in by a simple formula that we could crank out in half an hour. Um, so there's no basis in law for that. Now what, what Maggie and I and Fairwinds have done is we've made a, uh, an interactive spreadsheet which we're going to make available to all activists uh, which allows you to calculate. It's not about how much cash they need. It's about cash flow. So if you imagine money building up and money being spent, as money's being spent, the money building up gets nibbled away. Well, we developed an Excel spreadsheet that starts out with 650 million that's in the fund and grows it at, well, you can vary the interest rate. So if you think the market's gonna get 5%, you plug 5% in. If you think you're 6%, you think 3%, you can adjust all of that. The fund growth is controlled. Then Entergy, not in this latest PSDAR, but in their earlier reports, gave schedules of how the money would be spent by year. So we put that in. So as the money is spent, we pull it out of the balance. Makes sense. If you do that, and the only thing you're doing is decommissioning Vermont Yankee, this job can be done in 2029. This is not a 60-year process. So Entergy for years has pulled the wool over our eyes until, as Chris explained, that just today they, they saw the light. They were using the fund, they were double dipping into the fund. What they were doing was they were also funding what's called the, in, the Independent Spent Fuel Storage Facility, ISFSI, if, IFSI. And the IFSI is not in 10 CFR 50.75. So what Entergy was doing, would, would have had to do, would have had to go to the state of Vermont, uh, go to the NRC rather, and ask for an exemption. And the NRC always gives exemptions because that's what the NRC does. You know, they're, they're in the exemption business. They would let Entergy take the money from the fund to fund the IFSI. Now, if the IFSI, and this is the spent fuel storage on site, what happens is eventually they sue Department of Energy. Department of Energy always loses and they give them the money back. So what happened, it's essentially an interest-free loan to Entergy. That's what they were going to use the fund. Now just today they, they announced they're not going to do that. If that's true, if they're not going to use the fund to fund the IFSI, the carcass of Vermont Yankee can be done in 2029. So we're looking at you know, a 14 year problem. I might even be alive to see this. You know, this is uh, <laughs> not, not bad. Uh, but what the energy analysis has done oh, until today has always assumed they were going to raid the IFSI 
to, uh, uh, they were going to raid the decommissioning fund to pay for the IFSI. And I don't think they're establishing a precedent by doing what they're doing because at Kiwani, I know they're raiding the decommissioning fund to pay for the IFSI. That's not in law and you need the exemption. Now the NRC can give exemptions because with SAP store, you've got 60 years. It takes, you know, you can play a lot of mathematical games to show you've got the money available 60 years from now. And, and that's, what th that's what's happened. So we've, uh, we will be providing on, on the site and, and for any activist who wants it, this interactive, it doesn't take, it, it's taken us several long hard days to develop it, but it's a, a, an Excel spreadsheet and you let one column grow and you make subtractions from it and at the end of the day you can determine how long, how much money you need and when in order to decommission. Yeah. Did they need you to do these calculations? And if not, why are they still in their jobs? That's, That's a great question. Um, when when uh, Jim Douglas was uh, governor, the, um, uh, Peter Shumlin appointed me to be on the oversight committee. And then when the, the and Peter was the, the president of the Senate, uh, president pro tem of the Senate. And as that job wound down, the joint fiscal office hired Maggie and I to watchdog the process to make sure there was 80 different commitments that Entergy had to fulfill that the oversight panel found. So uh, we were contracted to the Joint Fiscal Office. And the report that, that talks about this leakage is one of three or four or five reports that we put up. So if you look up on the JFO site, Joint Fiscal Office site, you can find the, uh, the, the Fairwinds reports. So anyway, in 2011, when uh, the Shumlin administration took over, um, the Department of Public Service convinced JFO to drop our contract and they said they would hire us. And it never happened. So since 2011, Fairwinds has never been involved in any of the analysis, whether it be the litigation or you know, support of the decommissioning or things like that. Uh, Commissioner Recchia at the meeting today, I believe, did indicate when he was asked by a legislator about how the department tracks the integrity of the, uh, the trust fund, did say that they had people on staff that were doing that. But Yeah. Well, I, we actually, one of the recommendations that, that we made to the Joint Fiscal Office was the trust fund is invested in a couple of banks, but most trusts don't suffer severe dips. And, and if you look at the, the swings in the Vermont Yankee Trust Fund every month, you know, it could be up 10 million and down 15 million the very next month. The volatility of the Vermont Yankee Trust Fund is extraordinarily high. And we got, we, we talked to an investment banker who refused to use his name, and, and he said, no, that's wrong. They're, they are investing in two volatile stocks because they want to pump the growth. Now, if you want high growth, you pump in risky investments. And so the, the fund has a lot of swings in it. Um, so this investment banker's recommendation to us and we to the Joint Fiscal Office was this fund is over-invested in risky investments. And it still is. Now, we talked to Doug Hoffer and Doug does look at the fund and, and has determined that they're not ripping it off. But do they have the right investment strategy to weather, you know, another 2008 uh, market dip? No, no, they don't. Uh, when it hit last time, the fund was cut in half. So if there was another market dip in instead of, in 2008, when, when the, 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 the market dip occurred, we lost half the money in the fund because it was invested in very volatile things. Now a lot of pensioners didn't have half their money disappear because those funds were invested more frugally. But energy, energy was pushing this. They, were, they had claimed in their hearings that they could get seven or eight percent growth. The only way you get seven or eight percent growth is to invest in risky investments. So the fund is, um, is on steroids right now and uh, it's time to um, look at the investment strategy so that if the market corrects that uh, we can still close for my Yankee by 2013. When the market I want to 
when the market corrects. Yeah. I just want to make one clarification here, because you and I were talking before we, uh, we sat down here tonight about what happened today. And I just want to point, this is what I wrote in my notes. This was from the meeting this morning uh, at the legislature. Michael Toomey, the, the vice president, said, uh, first he said that decommissioning, the decommissioning fund uh, includes spent fuel management dollars. That's the first thing he said. Uh, and that's what gets us up to their $1.24 million estimate because it includes a significant chunk. $1.24 billion. Of e. Billion. Yeah, billion. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but he also then later said, we have established a line of credit and will use lines of credit in 2019 and will pay down the lines of credit with judgments from the, uh, the Court of Claims. But I'm not sure that includes the uh, IFSI. Uh, yeah. So I, he didn't explicitly say they were going to oh. pay for the IFSI, but he said they're going to use the lines of credit huh. in well, 2019. In so I don't know what the price differential is between the construction of the pad and the actual movement of the, the fuel and the purchasing of the casks and so mm -hmm. forth. But there could be. I just wanted to make that clarification. What, we looked, we based our cash flow on the 2012 report that Entergy provided because it's not in this new PSDAR. Right. And, and up until 2012, they were definitely going to pull from the IFSI. Um, they were going to pull IFSI money from the decommissioning fund. And um, uh, it, you know, it behooves the state of Vermont to, to find out what the hell he really said and what he really meant it. Today. And they, they may, may well be pulling it or, or intending to pull it from the fund. I mean, they, mm -hmm. that was the other confusing part today was that on the one hand they said, we believe that we can use money from the, uh, the spent, I mean, from the uh, uh, radiological decommissioning fund for spent fuel management or fuel management. And uh, literally minutes later they said, but we, are going to use lines of credit for spent fuel management. Now, he didn't quantify, so yeah. we'll see what comes out. But. Well, there's two legal arguments that, especially for merchant plants, like Chris was saying, really need to be um, discussed at a congressional level. And, and the first is, does, does IFSI come out of a decommissioning fund? And I think the answer is no. As I read 10 CFR 50.75, I can't find spent fuel storage in there. And uh, then the other one, I'll And you must have a special copy that you're not going <laughs> <No>. to <laughs> You hold it up to the light and That's look through it. <laughs> so that, uh, uh, two more slides and then uh, I'll be done here. Um, so it, this is interesting. I want to quote Bill Sorrell, um, uh, as quoted in The Digger. Uh, Sorrell said, uh, Entergy could treat the fund as a cookie jar. His word, as a cookie jar that could be used for, quote, any number of things. That's, that's truly frightening when our AG recognizes the same thing that we're coming up with, that this, there, there is no body watching this cookie jar right now. And uh, shame on us as Vermonters if, if we allow that to happen. You know, we have to remember that, that we have skin in this game. At the end of the day, if, there's, if they get through this and there's money left over, half of it's ours. And the, and the other half is theirs. And the other half right. is theirs, right? right. But if they don't have any money left over, all that money's gone to their wholly owned subsidiary. So it's in their advantage, to their advantage to use it all, whereas it's to our advantage to make sure it's, it's prudently spent. Yeah. Um, the last, I think it's the last, I might have one more slide after this, but Susan Small here, who, who for years has done a phenomenal job, ever since I've been on this in 2002, my hat's off to Susan especially, um, wrote in uh, January 13th, 30th, this is just two weeks ago, uh, she got some quotes from the NRC, and the NRC guy, a guy named Watson, who Chris talked about, he said, quote, ultimately it's a parent guarantee and legal responsibility. So, you know, Vermont Yankee is an LLC. I looked at the corporate chart, it's really exciting. The, the Vermont Yankee LLC reports into another LLC that reports into a third LLC before it gets to Entergy. And here's the NRC saying, 
ultimately it's a parent that's ultimately responsible. I can't find that in law. And one of the things I'm going to ask in the, uh, in the hearings next week is, show me, point to the sentence that says that with three different LLCs in a row here, you can go through to them to the parent. I, I've talked to many lawyers and they laugh. They say, the reason you set up LLCs is to prevent that. And we've got an LLC on top of an LLC on top of an LLC. What's going on here? Um, and Watson said, the, the other part of his quote was, they are legally responsible for the safety of the plant. The parent company is legally responsible for the safety of the plant. And again, every lawyer I've spoken to has said that that's, no, hang on, just let me finish my last slide here and then, then we can open it up. Um, so so the, in, in closing, the, the last piece is the, the other thing that came out today. So two things came up this week that I think uh, put ener energy on the, uh, on the defensive. The first is the leak which is going to raise the cost to decommission a plant, and it's just not in the plan. The, the plan as they presented it is a generic one that really didn't even include the ground contamination from the AOG building, which we now has, has moved. And the, the second piece then is the fact that as an LLC, they admitted today that after 60 years, they can walk away and they feel that they are no longer legally bound. Uh, you know, both of those things, we as citizens should put the heat on to, uh, to make sure it doesn't happen. I guess I'm, I'm done. I've spoken my, I've vented. <laughs>